Hello and welcome back to a new conversation from our series of challenges in software development. I'm Alex from Mosaic Work Studios and today I'm very excited because we have a special guest uh, who usually lives in US but I think today is in Brazil, right? Um, Joy Oder and let me tell you a few things about um, how I met Joe. We met uh, probably seven, eight years ago at an Agile conference in Porto, but uh, what I didn't know is that I was going to meet people that were much more involved into communities that go way back into uh, software development, into object-oriented design, into architecture, into patterns, into all these things. And uh, Joe, you are one of those people who have been very involved in these communities and uh, we'll go into a bit of introductions now what i know about you right now is that you are doing a lot of um, research uh, you are doing you working for clients doing development you have a company but you also work for a, a non-profit the hillside group and uh, promote the patterns and all this. So we'll kind of have to take them one by one. But first okay. of all, I think it would be interesting to hear about how you got into programming and how you kind of evolved into this <laughs> okay. area. Uh, okay. How I got into programming. And it, well, and that definitely tells some of my thinking, my biases or my mindset from that. But uh, I actually got involved with programming originally back in the 80s, believe it or not. So I'm a little bit of an old timer uh, <laughs> from, from that. And then in the late 80s and early 90s, I went. I was doing my graduate work. So I, I did my undergraduate at the University of Iowa in computer science and mathematics and mm -hmm. was real excited about it and decided to go to the University of Illinois for graduate school. And you know, we did a master's and worked on PhD work there at the University of Illinois. And, and that's where I ran into uh, Ralph Johnson and joined the Software Architecture and Patterns Group. Oh. And we were really committed to what makes for good design, good architecture, language independent, because we were even doing whether it's functional or OO, but at that time OO was having a big, uh, a lot of growth. And, and we we're trying to learn how to model around the business domain and really oh. do good domain modeling around what the users need and try to do a good architecture. Um, and I got involved with the patterns community from being involved with one of the uh, Gang of Four authors, Ralph Johnson, since I was part of the research group. And we were looking at even giving, we were reviewing the patterns book as it was being written and giving feedback. And then we started the patterns conference that was from the Hillside group is why I'm involved with that. And, and actually at the second plop with Brian Foote, we, Brian Foote and I noticed that although we talk a good game a lot of times and we, we always have good pictures of what architecture should be, what we practice and what we preach is quite different. And that led us to, that uh, motivated us to write, maybe we need to admit this fact and come correct with it. And, and it's related to kind of like what worse is better, uh, Dick Gabriel's first open source or what uh, you hear uh, Ward Cunningham talks talk about when, when, when he talks about technical debt. But mm -hmm. we talked about the big ball of mud architecture. Why is it so successful? We didn't we didn't write it as an anti-pattern. We wrote it's successful in a lot of ways. What leads to that? What to keep aware of that so that it doesn't get out of control so you can still sustain your architecture later. And so we wrote a lot of patterns about that in the late late nineties. And I think it was actually published in ninety-eight, but it's still relevant today. You still see a lot. I've, I've seen things in even the Financial Times and other things related to the big ball of mud um, and technical debt's a lot related to that. And then even later with Rebecca Wurzbrock, uh, who you had mentioned, uh, we wrote even some more sustainable architecture patterns. How can you kind of sustain it and do a little mud prevention type things? Because just like as a chef's cooking, you're going to have some mud, yeah, you know, a little bit of dirt, dirty dishes. If you don't keep your kitchen in order, pretty soon you can't cook anymore. Same way with Software, we want to make our software more habitable, as Dick Gabriel talks about, some bit more livable. We know we're going to have messes at times, but we have to pay attention to that or else the mud gets out of control. Mm -hmm. And then you have what you have, a big ball of mud, ugly spaghetti code that you can no longer even uh, make any change without affecting other, uh, uh, other parts 
you didn't expect to uh, affect. Yeah. So that's a, that's a little bit. I got motive. That's what influences my mindset a lot. Uh, committed to good architectures, good frameworks, reusable. to come back recently. Uh, I'm language agnostic and I'm technology agnostic, but I am committed to good architecture, uh, good practices, and good team building type things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's interesting. Um, I was just rereading your paper uh, today on the big ball of mud and uh, one, one thing that strikes me is that it's very well written. <laughs> it has thank you. Like, like the it went pros. through quite a few iterations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I imagine it that took a, the... that one nice thing about the just to add something to that for you is one thing we do at the Hillside Group and we decided early on at the Patterns Conferences and uh, Dick Gabriel had come. Uh, he had also went back and got an MFA in poetry and he writes a poem a day. <laughs> but one of the things that that professional writers do is they always go and give it to other authors or other peers to get feedback before they do the final publication. And they do writer's workshop. And it's like, well, if we're gonna, we need to do a better job in computer science and sharing about best practices. And so we shouldn't just put this out there and then just talk about it or publish it. We should get a lot of feedback and do writer's workshops. So that paper went through quite a few iterations of getting a lot of feedback from a lot of people before we, we got to the final version. And that's part of what happens at the Hillside Group sponsored conferences, PLOPs, we call it, pattern language mm -hmm. programs that we hold around the world. Yeah. So uh, I'll just read a few uh, sentences because they are quite uh, a very good example of, of writing. It says a big ball of mud is haphazardly structured, sprawling, sloppy duct tape, and bailing wire spaghetti code jungle. We've all seen them. <laughs> These systems so show unmistakable signs of unregulated growth and repeated expedient repair. Uh, yeah. And it goes like this. So it's really, it's an amazing, it's really nice to read it. Uh, <laughs> to say you know what's way. interesting in that paper, if, if you don't mind me adding, is mm -hmm. when Brian and I were writing it, okay, we've talked about a lot of practices that you see part of Agile today that leads to that if you're not careful. Mm. So one of the patterns is keep it working, right? Yes, keep and it working. Peace, build growth, mm -hmm. and those other. Well, that's doesn't that sound kind of like agile? So keep <laughs> it working, peace, build growth. You're evolving, and, and so some of these agile practices, which are good practices, we agree nowadays. Uh, if you're not careful and you don't pay attention to your architecture and kind of create good layers or create some bounded context to kind of protect things or anti-corruption layer, as Eric Evans may talk about. You, you can uh, end up with, with uh, a really messed up code with this. And so some of, some of the things that lead to it are what we consider still today good practices, uh, especially in the Agile community with that. And I was kind of surprised when I really thought about that because we wrote this before the Agile Manifesto, even though we were, I was, I was with, I had a, 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 we started with the refactory. We were the group that did the first commercial refactoring tools. So I was lucky to be with that group. That's why my company is the refactory. Well, I, I, I had a team of developers and we were doing uh, extreme programming in TDD even in the late 90s before the Agile Manifesto. Mm -hmm. But if you look at those practices in the big ball of mud, it really talks about uh, a lot of things that you, you see in Agile. Uh, yeah. So you, Agile can be good, but you still have to pay attention to architecture. And a lot of people with Agile, there, that's a myth with Agile. Uh, me and Rebecca put together this website, agilemyths.com, where we've been playing around <laughs> with issues with that. You still have to pay attention. A lot of people think that, oh, just don't worry about the architecture. It'll magically emerge, you know, and, oh, just wait till the last responsible moment, which unfortunately gets translated to last possible moment quite often. Yes. And, and we've been promoting with Agile Architecture the most responsible moment. There might be a more responsible, mm -hmm. even though we could have waited, we, maybe we should have done it a little bit earlier. Uh, not, and it's not over design. It's finding, it's putting on your roadmap responsible moments for dealing with architecture. And it's still okay to think about architecture as, as you go and being agile. Yeah. And I, so the book was alluding to that. Yeah, it was really interesting to see this. Uh, I noticed it as well. And I think that um, whenever, 
whenever we go and consult people in agile software development, we, we place quite a lot of uh, stress on architecture. So we try to, to think a bit more ahead. <laughs> Even if you don't use everything that you are thinking of, at least you've thought of it. It's kind of the, that thinking matters. It's yes, yeah. It's just it's, it's a, in fact I relate to Daniel, Daniel Kahneman's uh, fast and slow thinking. It's okay to have both. I mean, we want to move fast, but we still need some slow thinking. We just don't want to get stuck, and we want to still do some thinking and experiment and adapt. So it's more rough adaptive yeah. planning is rather than. You, no planning, that's not agile, or or a lot of upfront planning, that's not agile, but we want a rough adaptive planning with some thinking and feedback loops. And even refactoring was supposed to be part of that as well. So if you look at TDD, it's like red, green, refactor. Well, a lot of people get caught up with red, green, red, green, red, green, let's just go fast. Yeah. And they for, the, you need to, that refactoring is some of that stop, slow thinking is, wait, are we, you know, maybe there's a better way where we're getting duplicate code. Let's refactor and pull this out and do some things with that. And that's important to have those practices or else your ball of mud becomes, the technical debt becomes so high that it, it's too hard to change things. <laughs> so it what is your experience? And then you have to replace it. Sorry, go ahead. What is your experience in practice with the ball of mud pattern? Uh, I imagine you work with companies who are in that situation and... Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and <laughs> so, sometimes, I mean, it's, it's almost scary in a way that sometimes I get related to balls of mud because me and Brian Foote were never promoting balls of mud. <laughs> we just yes. talked about, let's, let's get honest. Let's, let's get, let's, if we admit it, then we can deal with it better. So a lot of times I get called in with, like one company here in Brazil, I got called in. They're like the equivalent of PayPal in Brazil. Uh, and their ball of mud wasn't too bad, but they definitely had a ball of mud. They had a few million lines of Java code. They were doing a lot of good scrum practice and other things, and they had about 20 some teams. Uh, and, and in fact, they had even written a paper that got uh, pretty well known. It got uh, published in one of the Agile conferences called Mega Scrum, where how they were growing up, it's kind of like Scrum at scale type things, mm -hmm. where what they did was they ended up being uh, four week sprints, which is a little bit at, at the maximum, mm -hmm. but they would do, they took all their teams and put them into kind of four sets of teams. So one week, one set of teams got to completely release their stuff. And so you were on a four week cycle. So that means the week before you got to release, the week you were releasing, you were doing, making sure everything, you were kind of like an integration hell week with all the others. So with 20 teams, 15 teams were de de developing, the other five teams were trying to make sure they integrated with all the other things. And it was causing just a, a lot of ruckus. And that's partly the ar architecture was, you know, there was a lot of coupling with a lot of different things. Even though I've seen worse, and, and a well-known company that we know, I got called in. Uh, they were talking to me. Try, they were looking at possibly hiring me for some refactoring. And then they had a ball of mud, and it's a very famous company that we all know, and I'm sure you've heard of it. Is uh, it's, uh, This company's called PayPal. And <laughs> PayPal, had uh, they had a single C++ class that was over a half million lines of code, close oh to a million. Oh, my God. <laughs> a C, yes. And... Um, and so they asked me how to refactor that. And I said, uh, very carefully, <laughs> I, you know, and, and ultimately they had to, because they were even having trouble getting the, you know, the IDE to open and things like that. But basically it was so core to their business because all the transactions went through and it almost became like a cancer going on in the code because say you're the new developer we've hired. We have core business stuff you cannot break. And it has to be really fast with lots of small transactions like pay PayPal. So you need to do something like what Joe did, but Joe's on vacation or he left the company. But don't mm. break what Joe did. <laughs> okay, Alex? So then you're the new guy. You, you, you've been trained and learning stuff. Well, you don't want to break what I do. Well, I know what I would do. I would copy what you did, take your name off, put my name on it. I know I didn't break what you did. Mm. Then I start hacking. I don't understand it completely, but I get the cases and I try to keep it working. And then finally, boss, look, we have it. Well, then that becomes like a cancer inside the software. We have all this duplication, and, and pr pretty soon, it, it just becomes a really messy type thing. If we don't go back and refactor that learning back in and do those types of things. So even some very famous successful companies have had to deal. Now, they, they evolved, and like this one company I worked with, they 
started using the strangler pattern and we evolved to mm -hmm. microservices and now we're very agile and lean. I mean, we release hundreds of things a day, all oh. small little types of things, all the microservices were with, uh, now we have uh, 10 times as many teams. There's over 200 teams. In a few years, they went from 20 some teams. Imagine if we were still having to work with that same code base with that same type of four week sprints. You couldn't experiment, it'd take a long time. And it's almost like doing the, I remember when I first met you, you were giving a talk about trying to do daily releases, right? Yes. And that's kind of what we were really, I really liked that talk. I, I almost thought, you know, really agile, I, I kind of super <laughs> ad, you know, trying to really get the extreme. And so that's where we kind of evolved to is try, architectural decisions make a difference. Now, microservices is not a dis silver bullet because mm -hmm. you're, you're distributing the architecture, so you don't want to have a distributed ball of mud. That's where it's in, at least <laughs> if it's contained, you could test it better and you could deal with cross-cutting concerns much better, right? <laughs> but, if you, but if you manage microservices right and you're growing fast enough and doing things, that's one architecture. Even in a monolith, if you separate the components well, and you've done things well, then then you can you can you can deal with some of these better. So uh, those are some of my experiences with working with some different companies uh, with that. Yeah, so it's interesting. I've never seen a half a million lines of code class in C plus plus, and <laughs> scary. <laughs> I don't even know how you would open it in a in Visual Studio. Probably you need Vim or Emacs or something like that. Yeah, they, they were they were not able to do that anymore. They they had to use other yeah <laughs> like Vim or Emacs and stuff. And um, but yeah, yeah they, 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 ultimately, they were forced to evolve from that. And, you know, but they, they were still it was still driving a lot of revenue. So it wasn't. I mean, yes. they got there. It, yes. it was it was a lot of smart people that got them there. It wasn't like they went out build a ball of mud, you know, but there was a lot of accidental complexity, or if you don't take the time or merciless deadlines, some of these things we talk about that lead up to that, the cut, copy, paste type thing mm -hmm. without going, uh, or, or copy, paste without going back in and uh, uh, refactoring and cleaning in and taking what you learn. Award Cunningham has very good short videos he talks about, about some things with managing, with dealing with technical debt, which I'd highly recommend. And me and Rebecca Wurzbrock also, also put uh, a few more patterns. It's kind of related to like the anti-corruption uh, uh, layer that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that with DDD they talk about. But we talk about putting a rug at the front door. Uh, you can protect the internal components that you want to be clean. Then maybe your muddy, a little bit of muddy stuff comes with your filtering, cleansing with this anti-corruption layer that you're doing here. And that way all your different services or different external systems talking into your protected stuff, you keep it clean, you're able to pay more attention. You don't have to worry about affecting all these external systems as you're evolving it. And that happens more through this this uh, this rug at the front door, this anti-corruption mm. layer, that, like what Eric Evans talks about. Yeah, that's interesting because so we teach um, a course in architecture occasionally. Uh, we were also called to teach uh, microservices architecture and things like this, but we always start with, you know, modular systems, what it means to have modular systems, what it means to have a module. And then once you have modules, you can deploy them as you want. You can deploy them in a namespace as a library, as a service. That's right. It, That's right. But the You want to go thing... do good architecture things independently. That's exactly right. And... Uh... And, and then, because even as you're going to microservice, you really need to think about the domain too still, because if all of a sudden, if it's too small or too big, you have the pains of maybe a micro lift, rather maybe it's not a monolith, but it's a micro lift, and then you still have a lot of connections <laughs> and, and still some of the same pains. But if it's too small, you get real chatty and you have distributed transactions. And so now there's a lot of dependencies between your microservices. Yeah. And that's just like dependencies between your mod modules inside. And so you have the, the same spaghetti code, the, the nightmare <laughs> that you were reading at first that uh, came out of our big ball of mud paper. Yeah, we. Uh, I find it ironic that we kind of keep reinventing the same problems. So uh, we we reinvented dependency hell, but now we distribute it so that it's more complicated yeah. <laughs> yeah. to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, maybe, you know, your next paper maybe should be distributed ball of mud because now <laughs> this seems to be like... Interesting. I'll have to think about that. One thing that I am writing up and putting together with some colleagues, so we've been working hard on making sure 
we have the essential microservice design uh, workshop we put together. And then we also do, we have a new ide ideals that we coined. So you know Uncle Bob's <laughs> solid principles, right? Yes. So that's pretty well known. You know your single responsibility mm -hmm. and and open for uh, extension but close for modification mm -hmm. and all those with solid. Even though it sounds pretty solid, sounds too tough for that. I don't know. But we come up with an acronym for microservices, and we've been uh, uh, putting ideals out there. We call it ideals for microservices. Mm -hmm. And so we've been pushing ideals and also using domain-driven design for modeling your microservices to get the right size. But the ideal, the I stands for interface segregation. That's just like mm -hmm. with solid or objects. But that's still the same. You want good interface, your yeah. API. And deployability is the D in ideals. That's mm -hmm. very important. And then with microservices, usually to kind of decouple things better, you do event-driven. And it, uh, so you do event-driven architecture. That way, the services aren't decoupled. So you're doing a pub sub, publish subscribe architecture that's been around long before microservices or yes. so or any of that. And then the A is availability over consistency. We go for eventual consistency, yes. but availability is so important. And then the L is for low coupling, loose coupling. Yeah. Uh, originally, we we had it without the L, but then after getting feedback from people, we decided it was ideas. But we evolved it, and then S was still single responsibility around modeled around the domain, and DDD can help with some of the, the, those mm -hmm. types of things with that. So ideals is a new, funny acronym like solid. <laughs> what is the the acronym for microservices that we're that we're promoting out there with that? Cool. I mean that that sounds right. All I I can disagree with anything <laughs> from what you're saying, and they it seems to describe a good microservice architecture in a very few key principles. It's it's quite nice. Yeah, we we knew we had to have a cool acronym to kind of compete with <laughs> solids. Yeah. So we were we were having fun with that. But but these yeah these ideals are important, and then there's a lot of patterns like microservices. If you're going to do microservice build distributed architecture. You, it's even much harder than building a, a monolith is still one of the first patterns off Chris Richardson's new book and stuff that he has. If you go to microservices.io is monolith versus microservices. Sometimes monolith, which, as you know, you've been around long enough before microservices. We didn't have the word monolith. It was the <laughs> architecture. You would have a layered architecture, whatever. Yes. Now we're calling things that are not these, you know, so there's an architectural style for microservices where building all these small independent de deployable microservices, which is part of the characteristics of the architectural style. And, but monolith itself is not bad. It gets a bad connotation. They autom automatically think legacy or something ugly, but sometimes it's the right way to go because there's a lot of cost with microservices. And if you're not growing and changing fast, and if you're not doing good practices, microservices is not the way to go with the right tooling and automation and DevOps but but it, but it, given the right cases, microservices can give you a big win. But you want to do these practices to kind of keep things separated well. So there's there's a lot of good practices. You might have to do the Saga or CQRS or a lot of other types of well-known mm -hmm. patterns that we see out in industry today. With that, otherwise you have a distributed ball of mud. Maybe I should write that up. That. <laughs> but one thing I've been working with with people that have a, a ball of mud with a monolith. And they want to start evolving and becoming, because uh, I have a talk I did a while back. I think you might like this one. It was kind of, it was a fun one. I put microservices for agility. And mm -hmm. we even had uh, a company, company's name, story, their story, how their evolution of microservices helped them to be more agile. But of course, you had to have good practices with that. And it, so architectural decisions influence agility. It's not just, it's not just the people yeah. side. It's a technical decisions and yes. the business decisions we make and how to support that. Together, and, and yes. And th th that was an important thing. Yeah, and that's this kind of alignment is very difficult to to get to in many organizations. Uh, yes. It is. Yeah, sometimes I'll share it with you. Next time I see you, I'll have to sit down and uh, <laughs> go. Because there's a lot. Of, but, but we're, we're writing some. So what they did was is they evolved from monolith to microservices, this, this uh, the equivalent of PayPal here in Brazil, and they're a very successful company. They've grown, they, they've been more than doubling and quadrupling in business for the last seven or eight years. And, you know, and now now they're like, in terms of revenue, like the 10th largest company in Brazil, in mm -hmm. terms of total revenue. So 
good problem to have. They, and now they're getting into banking and all kinds of stuff. They're, they're ba basically become a bank uh, equivalent here. And now they have the regulation issues yeah. with that. But what they ended up uh, dealing with, with with that is as they're evolving to, they evolve from the monolith to microservices, we use the strangler pattern. And so I've been writing up a lot of the strangler uh, type pattern evolution. So when you're going, if you have a monolith and you had good reasons for having it, it still it generated a lot of revenue for them and helped their company get where they are. They wouldn't want to start off with microservices. They may not have succeeded. But yeah. once they got to a certain point, now how do you evolve and take benefits and how to get rid of some of the pains that they had from the monolith and evolve and get the benefits of the microservices doing it properly. So there are some good patterns that, that I've been working on writing with some colleagues of mine that we plan on publishing out there soon on that evolution. Yeah, that's really cool. And we'll discuss more about patterns because it's a, uh, it's a very interesting part of our history and our <laughs> present that's I think is not yes. well known uh, yet uh, but before that um, you referred to uh, how you um, thought about ways to accelerate agility and basically have agility using technical things and I remember one of the things you were doing when we were back in Porto was uh, adaptive object models and those were quite interesting um, can you share a few things about them for for our viewers? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I definitely have a passion for the, and I call it the adaptive object model architectural style. So just like pipes and filters is an architectural style, there's a different ways of developing. And what the adaptive <laughs> object model architecture style was is we have new types of maybe products and services that we're providing, and they're changing <laughs> somewhat in a predictable way. So rather than having to go and every time we have a new requirement to go write a lot of code with lots of other potential side effects, is we can maybe have write an architecture, it's a meta architecture where we're taking metadata, we can describe some of these changes. And so we create a DSL, a domain specific language, so that we can describe, maybe we have new types of financial products. So we can describe mm -hmm. these new types of financial products with the rules and we can work with the domain experts, even giving them a, a GUI or some way of describing these and validating them. And then we can, you, through metadata, we're interpreting this metadata and doing that. And so it gives uh, ultimately the maximum of flexibility. Back in the 90s when I was originally looking at this, it was kind of ahead of its time because the interpreted systems at the time, people were considering, ooh, metadata is not so, it wasn't so popular, but nowadays, People mm -hmm. use metadata and frameworks all the time, so it's become more accepted. And so doing these kind of ideas where you can do, define new types of things or new types of rules and use some kind of data. I mean, it even relates back to when we had procedures and save things in a database or save it in a file for configuration. That's kind of the core essence mm -hmm. of it. But then you can up, uplift it a little bit. So now it's even more powerful. Where we, can, we have ways of describing new types of things with what their attributes are. So new types of maybe where you have a store and new types of things you want to sell in your store. Now we want to sell sweaters. So we have ways of describing what sweaters are, what their attributes are and what the price is and uh, how to put it in the catalog and, and how it's going to be billed for customers and what the rules are associated with that. So we have ways of describing that without having to go write a lot of new code because it's interpreting from this uh, DSL. So we're quite, kind of creating a higher level language. And so that, that can give you kind of a lot of agility as well. Um, and, but, but there's trade-offs. Once again, uh, sometimes people over-design with it and yeah. try to take it too far. So uh, anything you can do, I can do meta. <laughs> meta is, and then some people say meta is better. <laughs> but I don't mean like beta, the programming language. Or sometimes it's better, but sometimes it can be worse. It can be like beta software. So yeah. um, just because I could do something meta and add an extra level of abstraction doesn't mean I need to do it. So it's important that if you do do it, that you're doing it based upon real requirements. You're seeing that this change yeah. is happening. You're not just guessing. So let's have mm -hmm. real business requirements. Maybe we write it with code and hard code it the, the way we need to do it the first time. Then we see the pattern. We had to do this second, third time. When we start seeing, oh, this is our business. We're going to have a lot of these. Then we can extract that and find a 
a way to describe those changes and, and have a way of put, putting the descriptions of that into some database, maybe even creating a, a visual language for having a domain expert change it even quicker. Yeah. So and that's this what the was, adaptive object model is And about. this was even, uh, you were thinking of that even before we had NoSQL databases and uh, which yes. allow this much easier now because, well, it's schema-less yes. so you can move more in code, <laughs> kind of the description right. yeah, and validation. Yeah, we would validation. always have to do funny object to relational mapping or we'd have to then you'd have, yeah. So we always had the pains of all doing all that before, but nowadays that's much easier to, to deal with that. Uh, how does this relate with uh, nowadays um, domain modeling, uh, domain driven design things? Because it seems like there is a connection. There, there definitely is a connection because mainly when uh, when we were looking at adaptive object model, you definitely have to get really close to the domain expert and model mm -hmm. the different types of things around the flexibility around the domain. But with DDD, you want to do that as well whether you're using DDD or any type of good domain modeling, even back good object modeling, even if you're doing CRC way back when, in which some people still do, it's still a good modeling technique or whiteboarding with modeling. You should model around the domain and think with a ubiquitous language, what's the common business language that we need to model? What are the different types of entities and attributes? And what are the different types of events that happen around the domain with that? So doing good domain modeling whether you're doing DDD or I mean adaptive object model or not is a good idea. You clearly have to do that with adaptive object model. Now, the, the time when you're doing the domain modeling, and even if you're using DDD to get there or, or other domain modeling techniques, the only time you would take it to an adaptive object model is if you start seeing that the domain is going to always have a little bit of change within these predictable ways. And then we can create a DSL. Yeah. from that perspective. Otherwise, if you have the core and you see it's pretty stable and maybe you have dynamic hook points for, that's one of our patterns for uh, adaptive object models as well we wrote up, and dynamic hook patterns, where you have a place where you could override custom corner cases without having to mess with the core framework. So maybe you write the core framework your traditional way, but then you have a dynamic hook point where you can plug in for this client their business rules so you can go write you know, some closure or a piece of Java code or whatever language you mm -hmm. want to work with in Ruby or whatever and plug in that. That, But you have a dynamic hook point where you can plug in a new service for this specific one off. But the core of the domain is staying stable. So then it doesn't make sense to, uh, you know, write a meta architecture on that because uh, yeah. meta architectures takes a lot of, you know, a lot requires a lot of expertise and you have to write a lot of extra support tools, testing support. Everything yeah. else. I mean, you know, you know as well as I do on a lot of this. <laughs> this is one of the things I liked in your. Um, uh, I think I went to the workshop, and you are working on this with Rebecca as well, if I remember correctly. And we were. One thing I liked is that we were also discussing about how to test these things, and that you need to create your some way of that allows other people to test. So whenever they create the meta objects, also to test the meta objects that they are. Right. Correct. So you know, you not only test the adaptive object, the meta architecture, then you need another, you have to build a testing framework so they can take the meta architecture and the metadata and test the real business rules. So, yes. okay, we can use, we could do traditional ways of testing the meta architecture, but then you have to create in your DSL language a way to, to validate the metadata with that architecture, is it really doing the rule the way the business expert thought? So you, yeah. you kind of have like an additional level of testing, whereas usually we just test the business rule directly. Well, now we're testing the meta architecture and as you said, as well as, but you, you still have to test the business rule and mm -hmm. is the metadata working right? And it, otherwise a business expert might put the wrong metadata in. You've given them a lot of power, so you want to make sure they don't do something stupid and cost their company a, a lot of money. Yeah, and I think these work very well for uh, the kind of e-commerce applications that sell a lot of different types of products. Uh, yes, e in insurance, e-commerce, e insurance, stock market. Yeah. yeah. Well, these, these uh, types. I've even done it in the medical domain. The medical domain was changing where there'd be new types of diseases. And so we could describe new types of diseases or you learn new things about the disease and you learn new types of treatments for that disease. So you can describe 
uh, and we, we could work with the domain experts. So the business analysts could work with the domain experts and more quickly describe and validate the new diseases. So even oh. in the medical domain. But we were seeing many, many domains where you could get this, but clearly the financial domain and insurance and things like that uh, definitely took advantage because they're changing so quickly with all that. They need a way to adapt quickly. They can't wait months or years for new software. They have to be within days or weeks or whatever. So yeah. having some ways to that is a big win for them. Yeah, you cannot wait for two months to introduce a new product in, <laughs> in yeah. your financial system sure. or, yeah, that's... All right, so uh, you mentioned TDD a few times, and I know that you have a specific way of doing test-driven development, which is uh, uh, is interesting to discuss about. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, just just I started doing te test-driven development back from extreme programming days, which was back in the '90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing a lot of small talk back then, actually. And at that time, uh, and and, I, and we were involved. We, we I was involved with a group that we did the before Martin Fowler even knew what the word refactoring was. We invented the term refactoring that mm -hmm. actually coined the term, and did the first commercial refactoring tools. And uh, and one of the uh, very important requirements for refactoring is to have good tests. So we were big parts of testing with that and having good test frameworks. And then when, uh, in the late 90s, in the medical domain, the Illinois Department of Public Health, we came in. And believe it or not, in a government agency, I'm like, well, we're going to do extreme programming. We oh. want to move <laughs> all the cubicles. And this was in the 90s. So it's even hard to do today in government agencies, let alone in the 90s. <laughs> but they were, having, they were failing a lot. So they had hired me to come in, and I brought a team of developers in. And we opened up and had a big open space, and we were doing pair programming. And we were uh, writing a lot of unit tests. And, and evolving with that. Now, as I've gone along and, and been doing TDD and promoting TDD, uh, if you do TDD completely by the book and, and the way Kent Beck talked about it originally, and even if you look at Scott Ambler who's promoted or Uncle Bob, if he says, ooh, you're not doing TDD, if you don't write your test first. So a lot of people push, you must write your test first. And I call that, that's a form of TDD, I call that TFD. Something me and Rebecca Wurzbrock were promoting out there is, what we call more of a pragmatic TDD. So there, it's like a chicken and egg. The main thing is if you're writing a lot of tests as you go, sometimes you write the test first, but sometimes you might do a spike solution and experiment mm -hmm. and figure it out. And now you're like, oh, okay, this is what we need to do. Then write a test and maybe refactor that spike back to clean the code up with that. That's okay too. Even though if you had written, you know, you might ask Uncle Bob or Kent back by the book, they say, oh, no, you're not doing TDD. But still, the, our main thing is still think, how am I going to validate this? That's still test-driven. Uh, but, but whether you write the test first or not depends on what adds the most value. Sometimes maybe it makes sense to write, but sometimes it's like, well, I'm not, this is my acceptance test, but I'm not sure yet of how to write that test because I need to experiment with a couple things. That's okay, too. Go experiment. Then take that uh, real short experiment, come back with feedback, uh, and now we've figured it out. Now we can write our tests, and, but still write your tests. That's what's important yes. with, with TDD. And then, and then uh, one thing that I think uh, this is another thing me, uh, that me and Rebecca have been pushing. A lot of people forget about uh, sprint or the, the, ver the first part of TDD. Are we even building the right thing? And so yes. Scott Ambler talks about you need to spend maybe a few days or even up to a few weeks thinking about what is this thing? And then you get into the fast cycle of TDD, red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor. But yes. it's important to still stop and think a little bit and uh, rather than just jumping in. You know, as engineers, a lot of times we just want to start coding right away. <laughs> Let's just get my hands on the Yeah, I understand that. I've, I've been there. I'm right there. Uh, but we still need, are we even going in the right direction? So having some of that early kind of brainstorming session, even if we need to do a little whiteboarding, uh, not get stuck. We're not trying to solve. What, let's think, what are we building and what are we going? What is the business rules? What are the business domain requirements? How can we validate this? And then let that drive us from, it's almost like even when you think about making a roadmap, you know, mm -hmm. you want to make sure you kind of create a roadmap to think, yeah, we well, can change the roadmap. 
you know, we're being agile, it's rough adaptive, but we, we should still at least have a vision of where we're going. Most people in TDD, they just get caught up with the red, green, red, green, and then they forget to take time refactoring. So that's a key part of it. And then uh, also uh, thinking about that. So I've even written some patterns about, if you do TDD, one cool thing about TDD, because I don't think TDD is dead. I think blind TDD is dead. Some people, you know, there's a big movement out there. Is yeah. TDD dead or TDD well. is dead? Yeah. And, and I'm not a big believer of that, but I think just doing simple TDD, you want to don't want to just write TDD for stupid test cases and for getters or setters or, oh, hmm. I want coverage. So I can give you 100% coverage, but you need to have good tests around the business domain. So that's one of the core important principles around that. And if you design around thinking about testing, you're making your system more testable. So we, we wrote some baby step patterns, you know, for TDD by baby steps and growing the system. The te by doing TDD, even if you're not exactly always writing the test first, you're still evolving the system so it's more testable as you go. Whereas if you don't do do any kind of testing is built in, you can make a architecture that's very hard to test. So by thinking about how I validate this, that influences your architectural design in a way that as you go to implementation, it can definitely help you uh, uh, create a system that's more easier to test. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a big benefit. Yes, and this is interesting, but I still think, so I, ne I always need to differentiate this because if you're just beginning with TDD, you've never done TDD and so on, first get under the belt the techniques. <laughs> Practice yes. them, uh, make sure that exactly. you understand the cycles and how they work and yes. so on. Yes. And afterwards, thank, thank you. after a while, yes. you can go there and say, okay, so what's more important now? What would be pragmatic? Do I need right. to write the test? <laughs> Maybe yes. I don't need to write the well, test. Actually, you bring up a very good point. I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned this because I believe this is not only true for TDD, but any Agile thing. When mm -hmm. I first learned Agile, like I'm going to learn Scrum or whatever or TDD, Learn it by the book and do it by the book. And that's more than just do it one time. You have to do it for quite a few weeks or maybe even a few months. We're going to do it. And now it's almost like a shuhari. You know, yeah. it's, it's okay. Now I'm le I've learned it. I've learned it from the, the experts, the masters. I've learned it from the book. Now I have to incorporate it. So I'm working with Alex and we're doing pair programming and TDD. We need to adapt to us what works best for us. We've learned it. We've practiced it. Now we said, some parts of it work better than others. Oh, mm -hmm. maybe we should do more strong pairing, where if you have the idea, you give me the keyboard on XP, and uh, I have to write the test. Uh, you're going to direct me, and then I'm going to give you the keyboard, and now you're going to do the implementation, and I'm going to direct you. So now we're kind of adapting it or whatever, and, and, then, and then maybe we come up with something new. But you're absolutely right. Early on, it's very important to... Because uh, otherwise, how can I say it doesn't work if I don't really learn it by the book and try it? And then I can adapt it. So, that, but that's true with Agile. If you're doing TDD a year from now, the same way that you're doing it today, I always say you're doing TDD wrong because you <laughs> didn't learn. Because part of the, the Agile mindset is constantly evolving and learning and experimenting. Just like a master chef is always trying a new creation or a musician with a guitar, they're always experimenting with different types of things. And some of them aren't good, but they learn from it. And then they create that masterpiece. So as we're doing TDD, we should be trying little things. And uh, okay, that doesn't work so well. Let's not do it anymore. Mob programming is big about that. They, they do TDD a lot, by the way. Mm. And they usually like, a lot of mobsters like to do it by the book. But one thing is they're, they're constantly learning and constantly retrospecting, not way waiting for a couple of weeks throughout the day, yeah. they're constantly trying new experiments as they're, as they're doing it. Yeah, so that is, but anyway, it's very interesting to see uh, these patterns and uh, these ideas around how to, how to optimize for various things when you are doing uh, test driven development or any of these practices, because in the end, that's where you get most of the value. You get a lot of the value from uh, doing the practice itself, but then the next level yes. is optimizing, and that's that's the hardest one to do right. because it depends a lot on your context, on your. It's there's not anymore a general solution that you can use, and it just works, and you know it's 
there is a very specific thing for your context and you need to pick the right tools, the right uh, ideas for the job. It's... Yes. Yeah, and this takes us to uh, to patterns. And uh, okay. because we've discussed uh, quite a lot about patterns, you mentioned a lot of published patterns and so on. Um, now, I have to say that um, I was surprised to hear about uh, the plop communities uh, back when we met. Uh, I had no idea they existed. I knew about the uh, uh, design patterns book, which kind of everybody knows. Uh, at that time, there was also a catalog on a Microsoft website uh, with a lot of design patterns. Uh, some of them were useful, some of them were not that useful <laughs> back then. Uh, depends on your context, yes. <laughs> yeah, depending on context. And um, But it was interesting to find out how, how old is this community? Um, okay, this community actually evolved. It's Now it's about 27 years old. We started in 93, around 90. 92, 93 is when the Gang of Four was putting their stuff together. Uh, some patterns work even goes before that with Christopher Alexander and building architecture. Mm -hmm. And even Ward Cunningham, Kent Beck, and some others were looking at patterns in the Uppsala in the late 80s and early 90s. But the Hillside Group, which is an educational not-for-profit, formed in 1993, and we started sponsoring these PLOP conferences. And it's pattern language of programs not pattern language of programming. Mm. Originally, they were thinking of just programming, yes. but then it went into program, so it could be, it's more than just programming as part of it, but it might be about architecture. It might even be about how teams, programs of things, how teams work together, or what makes for good, high productive teams as well, things along that lines. And in fact, now we even have people outside the software industry that's formed our community. Uh, I'm the president, I'm currently the president of the Hillside Board, and uh, so I'm involved with trying to help promote a lot of these. But the main thing about patterns, patterns are the thing we liked about patterns and we realized in the 90s is, is we've done a dismal job as computer scientists with sharing knowledge about, about good practices and what we should do and what we shouldn't do mm -hmm. uh, uh, over time. And so the uh, patterns are like within the context, given a problem, here are some proven solutions. They've been proven themselves. These are good practices that you could try. Uh, sometimes, even if you say maybe, as engineers, we like the word problems, but designers don't like, I'm not solving a problem. I'm creating some cool new design. <laughs> so even with designer, you might think, given a, a situation or, or a, 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 a design type challenge, here is a technique, uh, uh, different types of techniques that are proven to help do that. We used to say they were the proven best practices, and then people would say, well, prove to me it's best. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to say it's necessarily best, but I can say with confidence, that's why we used to have the rule of three, show me at least three cases where this is proven that, that it's very useful. So we can at least say that these, these techniques have proven themselves that they are useful get within this context. And so we decided to get together within the uh, we, we created the Hillside Group to let's have a better way of documenting and sharing knowledge like other disciplines. For example, engineers for building bridges, they have huge catalogs yes. of doing the right thing and not through it. They have thousands of years of experiences of building bridges, so they don't want to build another Tacoma bridge that where the wind gets and blows it down or things like that. We need to start doing a better job. And originally in software, where the Hillside Group evolved from, and then Christopher Alexander was looking even at building architecture mm -hmm. with how to put quality and life into systems. We have the quan, the quality without a name as part of it. But we started sponsoring these conferences all over. We started in the U.S. Uh, at Allerton by the University of Illinois with the PLOP conferences. And then we had in Europe, in Germany, uh, Euro PLOP. But we've had Viking PLOP that happens in the <laughs> Scandinavian oh, countries. Cool. We've had a guru plop in India, Asian plop in Japan and Taipei, a sugarloaf plop because the first one was in Rio de Janeiro where the sugarloaf mountains are, but now it's been all over Brazil and also in Argentina and Chile. Um, and we've even had special plops like scrum plop around a domain. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so that wrote it just, in fact, I was part of that. We recently just released and wrote a book on scrum patterns to help people stay focused on what a lot of people learn scrum by the book, but then they're stuck. Yes. So then how do they get out of that? And so we write a lot of the patterns that talks about when you do one thing or other, how do you split your team, mitosis, and how, how do you keep value and keep on the value stream? So that scrum plop was focused around writing the best practice or, or uh, proven practices as you're evolving from that. And we even had, uh, we had a meta plot for the meta architecture, adaptive <laughs> object model patterns in Doro Valley. And uh, Ralph Johnson and some people from Intel and Microsoft were also involved with para paraplot, parallel programming patterns. Mm. And, and they wrote a few books based on that. So it's really about patterns for me are like anti-patents. They're for sharing knowledge and this help uplift. <laughs> and so one of our big things is we're trying to help each other and give back to the community. And so one of the things we do at our conferences is we always tell people to bring little gifts to share, inexpensive type things uh, to remember. Cool. So it's part, it's part of our community. We, we play interactive games to get us working to, well together. Nice. And, and we have part of this, this giving. People are giving their papers and you give back them the comment of how to make it better to share knowledge better. But it's really about sharing knowledge and giving back rather than trying to protect or hold on to something. Let's try <laughs> to do better and help help your neighbor and help us help your, your, your brother with this or sister. Yeah. So, and can you describe a bit what's happening at the PLOP conference and how you end up with these patterns? Because I think it's an interesting concept. Yeah. So there, there's many conferences. In fact, I hope that we can do one in Ro yeah, Romania yeah. soon. What was the name of the one we wanted to do again? Uh, do you remember? You had Plop a camp. pointed term for it. Plop camp, yes. Plop so I hope camp, we can do a yeah. plop camp in Romania. I'm excited about that. And so anybody watching this, more to come. I, I hope that, I yes. think we have the popcamp.com or something like that. Yeah, we, that we have the domain. At. But what right? happens is, yeah, yeah. and we, we, so will, things, we will be working on it. But yeah, okay. Cool. So something that happens at plops is a few things can happen. One is people can submit, uh, they can write together different pattern ideas that they have submit them and then they'll get feedback and we go through shepherding first to improve it before you get to the conference. And at the conference, then we'll workshop those papers in a writer's workshop group, a very uh, intimate group of people giving feedback to help make it better. Then the mm -hmm. author goes back and improves it. We also have people have new ideas, which we might do at Pop Camp. We can do pattern mining. So if yes. you come in, you have an idea of patterns that haven't been written yet. So I'm gonna be, uh, in, next month I'm gonna be in Porto and then I'm going to go up by uh, Amsterdam, and, we're, and there's an edu. They're looking at uh, pedagogical patterns, you, you know, educational patterns. Mm. That they're, 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 they're writing. And uh, um, there, they're going, to, they're going to do is be brainstorming, and we're going to be brainstorming what potential patterns may be. And then you can even have the beginning of swarming together to write some of the patterns. So that can happen at PLOPS as well. And then we may have focus groups where we also get together about using patterns. Or like you said, there was a, some of the patterns were more useful than others. Maybe we get together and we can learn together uh, how do the patterns relate and when should I even think about using these patterns over others? Kind of a relationship uh, or because so, usually you never do a pattern by itself. So when I'm building a system, it's not like I just have the strategy pattern. Mm -hmm. I may be having the strategy with an adapter. Maybe I've also, I, 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 I'm also, uh, I, I need to uh, have a composite, and so I have a composite because I'm building some kind of dynamic system, so I have the composite pattern, but I have pluggable strategies for the business rules. So usually you, you want to have scenarios of how you use patterns together uh, for solving a more complex patterns. And so given a complex problem, what are kind of the sequence, we call them sequences, mm -hmm. uh, around that. So the Hillside Group is we're really dedicated to building the community and the community of trust for getting people together and sharing that knowledge. And it's helped not only pattern authors, but pattern users or people that want to brainstorm new type of potential patterns, whether they want to write them or not, they would at least would like to get together and talk about good sequences of use of the patterns and share that knowledge. So where can people find- So the, lots of these can happen. Where can people oh, find the written uh, patterns? Yes. Uh, well, we're working, there's, there's, there's so many out there, in fact, we 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 uh, we did 
I wrote a paper with Gregor Hopi and Rebecca and some others. We did an IEEE paper on 20 years of impact of patterns. We wrote this about seven years ago. And we did, at that time, there's over 10,000. Uh, our calculations were more than 10,000 patterns oh. written and distributed all over, some in many books and all that. And so there's an effort by the Hillside Group as well as the Hillside, uh, the Hillside Europe as well, because we have a sister organization in, in Europe. They sponsor the Europlop that happens in Germany every year. Uh -huh. Is we're trying to get build a good pattern repository so we can have a, a single place to go to find all those for like, for example, like your wiki of yeah of, of pattern for that. And so we're, we're trying to go with that. But that number sounds huge, and uh, we know and it's growing. And it's growing, and we most yeah. of us know, of course, the um, uh, Ganga Four design patterns uh, but how can but you, you to hope to learn net, more <laughs> yeah so if you go to hillside.net we have a lot of pointers now and uh same way we have links to a lot of the online public we have all our publications of all our patterns since uh, 1996 so you can find a lot of the patterns there we try to link to a lot of the books that are out there and uh and we're trying to update that but we have a big Push. Uh, there's a lot of work. In fact, our friend Adamar from Porto is involved as well. Mm -hmm. When you went first time I met you at Adamar, yes. uh, he has a group uh, that he's involved with, with trying to build this better repository. But we we, we have definitely some places, uh, or you Google the type of problem you're going and pattern, whatever. Then hopefully you can find links to it. But uh, we we do definitely have all our proceedings are online with all. The many patterns, which are patterns not only about architecture, many about architecture. So, you know, one, one interesting trivia is that uh, one reason why I remember the PLOP communities is because PLOP in Romania, uh, the word means an aspen tree. <laughs> so, oh, nice. <laughs> cool. So it, it's a weird name for a community. <laughs> I don't know if it's weird yeah. also, in, but and for Romanian, it's a and in the U.S., even with English, you think plop is something plops down. It kind of falls. <laughs> with that. So we have our weird acronyms, but uh, it's, it's got a legacy with it, for yeah. sure. But uh, Aspen okay. Tree, that's interesting. So you had, uh, I think we, we could go for more time and discuss a lot of things. I could stay with you for hours, but uh, I'd like to draw to a close. So some of the... Before we end, uh, what are you doing that's interesting nowadays? <laughs> Some of the new stuff um, that you are trying. Recently, a lot of the fun stuff I've been working, I mean, one of my main goals is to help teams succeed, not only from the agile side, but from the technology side as well. And there has to be, you have to build the bridge. And so our technology decisions influence how lean and agile we can be. And we really need to think about that as the business grows and evolves. So I've even looked at, I don't know if you've heard of Kent Beck's 3X stuff, where we call it explore, expand, yes. and extract, yes. normal business S curve. And, and a lot of times people, companies miss a lot of that type. You still want to be innovative, but parts of your business, you can't use, you can't do the same practices depending on what part of your business you're working on. So I, I've definitely been working a lot with companies succeed with not only the agile side, but we need good data to do that. So one thing I've been working with a couple of my colleagues with a sustainable architecture, managing technical debt, but also which relates to keeping your ball of mud from getting out of control, but we need data and we need metrics. Uh -huh. But one thing I found out teams, you can't just throw metrics at people. <laughs> the team has to value it. So yes. it's important uh, that, for example, I have an example that I got from Rebecca, that I think some of your teams I mean is that you had your own internal checklist that the yes. team created for their daily check, daily stand up for their checklist. And so when we talk about our checklist pattern that me and Rebecca wrote, we talk about the team must own it. Same way with metrics, metrics the team must own. So uh, if I want to improve, the team should always be lo looking at that. So like if I'm using sonar, you get so much data, you get overloaded. Yeah, we need to find what yes. data provides value and then make that visible. But then the team, just like we said, that with learning XP by the book or, or TDD, 
once you try, you need to constantly be evolving it. Same way with metrics is uh, you need to be evolving it. So there might be some technical debt issues that are causing some pain. Maybe we want to make it visible and we can find metrics that add value. So another thing I've been working on is fantastic metrics and where to find them. We relate to <laughs> Harry Potter's fantastic beasts and where to find them analogy. But uh, and we have this we have this uh, canvas, this uh, metric canvas where you can do a lightweight means of brainstorming. What kind of problems or issues are we are, we're having? What are some issues coming up? What are some different types of metrics we can experiment and we can iterate through the and give us some action steps and following up? And then you should constantly be evolving this to add value with that. So I've been uh, I'm a big proponent of you can only fix what you see. So yes. you have to make things visible. And data is not good or bad. I mean, just if you if you say you want 85% coverage, and that's what you're rewarding developers, they'll give you that. And I was at a company where that was a requirement, 85% coverage. And uh, so the developer, in order, they were on two week sprints. They had six teams, four teams in India, Scrum teams. They were doing Scrum, and they had a Scrum of Scrums at the beginning of each sprint. One team was in India, one team was in China, four in the U.S. And every two weeks, we, you know, you, you, and we had integration and we had a celebration of everything we had done. But it was required 85% coverage before you could check your code again. So if, if given that requirement, and that's what you're going to tell developers, what kind of tests do you think the developers were writing? No asserts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, hardly any asserts, but they gave you coverage. If, if that's yes. what you're requiring, in fact, in Java or a lot of... I could give you 100% coverage, right? I can just write and uh, yeah. some kind of dynamic thing that, but but that's not the point. The, the the point is, I would rather have really good test before I have coverage. I know, but so metrics itself, you don't want to just throw at things. You have to think about well, we want coverage because based on good tests, because we don't want to write a lot of dead code or we want to keep focused. So then, if developers understand that and they value that then they'll stay focused and do that. So it's important for the whole team to find metrics that add value and, and see what we can use for improving. We shouldn't be afraid. Ooh, you're going to see all the dirty code I wrote oh. if I show you my metrics and now you're going to... So it shouldn't be like a weapon. It should be like, no, this is like uh, we're learning to improve. And it fits into that continuous improvement, that mind, to me, the agile is a mindset. A yes. way of thinking yes. on that continuous learning and that continuous improving, but you need data to do that, yes. and so having data can do that. So I put a lot of work in that recently. Also, I put a lot of work into agile architecture and, and how to evolve and, and how to be agile and do that. So start your architecture. You know, you might have a reference architecture. You're climbing on the shoulders of giants. You might have to find where it hurts or plan for responsible moments. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and and do the most, find the most responsible moment in your roadmap or put it on your backlog. You might have some, you might have a test architecture. You want part of your uh, core architecture. and trace. So when you begin the architecture, there's some patterns you can use. And then we've also had some uh, patterns that you do afterwards, such as, you know, architecture in the backlog. Um, there, there's other, you might have architectural spikes. Technical debt management needs mm -hmm. to be part of that continuous inspection. So there's some automated tools you can add that give, even give you IDE as I'm writing is, oh, I'm violating some architectural rules. Well, maybe I need to violate it because the framework's not good enough, or maybe because I'm the new guy and I, I don't realize that there's a lot of, uh, you know, I'm the new developer and I don't realize there's a lot of uh, uh, framework stuff here I should use to prevent SQL injection. <laughs> so maybe we can automate and put some kind of thing to give that instant feedback, we, we wrote some continuous inspection patterns on that. And oh, in some cool. languages, you can even automate some of that. And so a lot of times that you're doing statical analysis, but you're also doing run, running software analysis, and you automate as much as possible, but some of your continuous inspection might still re require, you know, maybe more pairing or mobbing because a lot of eyes looking at that team. So I've been doing a lot of work with helping people with success with, with, with that and evolving from that as well. And then, of course, since micro, there's a microservices hype, but I'm <laughs> trying to make sure people do microservices correctly because there can be a big win. Uh, so I've been really uh, kind of really helping uh, essential microservice design patterns, taking some of the core stuff, and then our ideals for microservices. 
uh, that I talked about before and pushing those about how to model around the domain. Uh, and, and actually, those, those types of modeling around the domain is whether you're doing microservices or not, <laughs> or whether, whether yes. no matter what, what you're doing, or whether you're doing DDD or not, you should still think about modeling around the domain. So I've really been trying to push this type of useful things. And then finally, one thing that I've really learned with companies that really grow fast, and the teams are growing fast, because I was at a company that a few years ago that had 20 teams, now there are over 200 teams still growing. People are always changing, and sometimes you lose good people or the person moves in the company, and now a real experienced team got all split up, is you need good ways of sharing knowledge. So it's related to the visibility with metrics, but not only metrics, but other ways about sharing architectural decisions and other stuff in an agile lean way without being too heavyweight, so to help wow. share that knowledge as a company really grows. So you have the good problem of success, but you need to manage it properly. So uh, that's been another thing I, I really had a passion about to help uh, people with that. Yeah, I've been thinking about uh, a lot about knowledge and the role, the key role it plays in software development, how important it is to maintain the knowledge, to distribute it, to, because I've seen teams that lost the whole knowledge of the system they were working in, and it's a very, very difficult problem to recover yeah. from. It's uh, And it can cost the company, it can cost the company tremendously. All of a sudden, they, they can no longer change that part of the system, they start losing business, Problems happen, they can't fix it. Yeah. Oh, it can be disastrous. It can be really bad. Okay, yes. so uh, before we end, I'm looking at a picture from your website where you are at oh. Uppsala 2007 with Fred Brooks and Dave Parnas. Oh, cool. That's yeah, that a, was exciting. That is very cool. In fact, cool. I, was, I was the panel's chair. That was in Montreal. To me, that was one of the best as I went to. <laughs> and actually, there, you can actually go on. A cool thing happened at that, right after that. <laughs> so uh, I, I was organizing the panel session. I was the, uh, the chair of the panels. And we got Fred Brooks and Dave Parnas to come back to the, the No Silver Bullet Revisited 20 years after uh, he had written oh. that. And they were part of that panel. But we also had Martin Fowler and other people on that panel as well, Dave Thomas, uh, and, and a lot of people on that. And and a cool thing happened, and you can actually find a short video of it if you go on YouTube. Uh, maybe I'll send you the link later mm -hmm. if you want with that. that but cool. what happened was is uh, the panelists were going, you know, Fred Brooks talks, and that was cool. I got to talk to a couple of my heroes, Fred Brooks and Dave <laughs> yes. Pornis. Yes. And Dave Pornis, they would talk a little bit. So there's a the typical panel where five minute kind of introduction. And then it came time for Martin Fowler to talk. And Martin Fowler all of a sudden fell down underneath the table and he's kind of shaking. And all of a sudden he comes up and he has a wolf mask on. And it's a real, <laughs> I mean, it looks awesome as anything. I mean, it's look, a, real, a realistic looking wolf. And he says, oh, well, this, nobody invited me to this party. I decided to come and tell you why uh, you, you're, uh, that there's no silver bullet still. <laughs> and and there's not, that even objects is not going to save you or whatever. There's still stuff going, going on. And there is no real silver bullet and and he and he stayed he, he played in form all the way through kept that mask on all the way through but it, it was awesome but that was kind of a cool conference there and then uh the, the youtube thing shows that part where martin fowler's talking with the wolf mask on it's a very <laughs> short so i think if you if you look at Uppsala uh 07 uh, google that or go to youtube and look at no silver bullet martin fowler wolf or something like that you, yeah yeah you, you, you'll, you'll find a nice short video of that there with fred brooks and everybody that's so awesome because i'm kind of a geek for software development history and these two people were <laughs> and if you add martin fowler to the mix it's already like a very interesting episode <laughs> from yes. history. yeah it was awesome yeah. Real funny. Okay, uh, Joe. So thank you very much. This was a pleasure. I hope to see you soon in uh, Romania, maybe for a plop camp, maybe for something else, or sure, or maybe somewhere else in Europe. Uh, who knows? I look forward to it. I will be in Europe at the end of uh, uh, March, as, as you know. But I'll come back too, and then maybe yeah, somewhere let's meet again. Yeah, that would be awesome. We so, have to. That would be really cool. 
uh, for uh, all of you who watched, uh, check out the links that we'll put in the description with uh, Joe's website and uh, some of the hillside group links and all these things because there's a lot of useful information there. It's just that we didn't know, <laughs> or at least I didn't know, how, how much information there is and how much useful knowledge is stored in, uh, in these places. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for yeah, watching. I've been, trying, I've been trying to update refactory.com, but it's always a challenge. So if you go to the refactory website, uh, and, and also I've got another one I've been working on, teams at innovate.com. So mm -hmm. trying to look at, so I'm trying to update a lot of stuff. And then, then I have links to other ones like the adaptive object model or the hillside, all the uh, not-for-profit or uh, sharing of knowledge things or agilemist.com, <laughs> things like that. Uh, and, and we're always looking for impact feedback on that, like Agile Miss. You can always go fast or what other. There's a, so we're looking for feedback on a lot of those links too. So yeah. definitely anybody wants to email me or get feedback, that's cool. I, I look forward to it. Yeah, and it's worth checking this whole uh, PLOP uh, community and the Hillside group because, again, it's been around for, I think it's one of the longest running communities because it's 27 years something like that probably will be uh, probably longer if you take into account that patterns were discussed before that but it's still mm -hmm. really really cool yeah so thank you thank you all for watching and until next time don't forget to think design and work smart Coming okay. next. We're clouded, we're clouded cross platform now. So we, we yeah. include uh, IntelliCode. And so basically what it is, is it's an AI driven IntelliSense engine. Mm -hmm. And so we allow you to, uh, or the first generation of this feature was that it would train itself on some code bases that we had in house, and then we would ship it out and it would it would learn things like existing patterns and it would suggest things like, oh, if you're if you're instantiating an iterator, we probably want we want begin, we want end, we mm -hmm. want these things that you're probably going to want in 90% of cases. Mm -hmm. And so when you see that autocomplete list in the IDE, it would pop up these these guesses at common patterns with a star beside it, indicating that there, it was coming from the IntelliCode engine, basically just trying to give you more intelligent suggestions mm -hmm. and, and speed up your productivity. And I think a really cool feature that we're coming out with now and that we're coming out with specifically in C++ now is uh, custom models, which is train it on your code base. So whatever style yeah, you like, cool. whatever, whatever uh, patterns you are actually currently implementing, you can say, hey, I want to train this model on my own code base. Oh. And then we can have intelligent suggestions that come from our design patterns.